Hello everyone, this is topic 3.2 properties of solids. This is taken from AP Chemistry College Board. In this video, I'll be talking that why any matter is a solid, what are the different types of solids and further, what are the properties of different types of solids. So let's start. In topic 3.1, I talked about the intermolecular forces. When the intermolecular forces are strong, the matter is solid. So you can see here that as the intermolecular forces are increasing, the state of the matter is changing from gas to liquid to crystalline solid. And here for solids, the kinetic energy of the molecules is minimum because they are tightly packed. In liquid, the kinetic energy of the molecules is a little bit more than solid so they can move freely and in gas, the kinetic energy of the molecules is maximum. So they are moving very freely in the current. So first of all, let's talk about the ionic bonding. The ionic bonding is found in ionic lattices. You can also call it ionic solids or ionic compounds. So the ionic compounds are formed by the gaining and losing of electrons. For example, if I talk about NaCl, the sodium atom loses one electron and it becomes sodium positive ion and that electron is gained by the chlorine atom and it becomes chloride ion that is Cl negative ion. So there is a force of attraction between the sodium ion and the chloride ion. The force of attraction between the ions is dependent upon two factors. The first is the charge on the ions and the second is the distance between the ions. And this force of attraction basically affects the melting point of the compounds. If the force of attraction between the ions is more, then the melting point would also be higher. So let's first see how the charge of the ions affect the force of attraction between the ions. So for that, let's compare the first two compounds and the last three compounds. The first two compounds have a charge of 1 and the last three compounds have a charge of 2. For first two compounds, the melting point is lower because the charge is lesser than these three compounds. The second factor is the distance between the ions. For that, I'll compare first two compounds. Here, the charge is same but the distance between the ions is different. If the sum of ionic radii, that is distance between the ions is more, the melting point is lesser. So this tells that that the force of attraction is inversely proportional to the distance between the ions. Apart from the melting point, the force of attraction also affects the lattice enthalpies of the ionic bonds. So we will be seeing that in the next slide. Now let's talk about the lattice enthalpies. Here the lattice enthalpies of different compounds are given. For LIF, the lattice enthalpy is 1036 kilojoules per mole and for LII, the lattice enthalpy is 757 kilojoules per mole. As the size of iodine is more than the fluoride ion, so the distance between the ions would also be more for LII. That is why the lattice enthalpy for LII is lesser than that for the LIF. Further, you can see that the charge of oxide ion is more than the iodide ion. So that is why the lattice enthalpy for Li2O will be more than that for the LiI. The ionic solids have little tendency to produce gas because of high boiling point. So that is why the vapor pressure would also be low for ionic solids. After the properties of melting point and the lattice enthalpy, the third property of ionic solids is they are brittle. So what is the meaning of brittle? Brittle means that the material is basically hard, but when you hit it by something, then it breaks easily. So in ionic solids, the ions are arranged in an alternate fashion because of the minimum repulsion between the ions. When this ionic solid is hit by a hammer, the layers slide on each other due to which the light charges come close to each other. As you can see here that the positive ion has come close to positive ion, the negative ion has come close to negative ion. Due to this, there is a repulsion between the light charges. And when there is a repulsion between the light charges, the crystal starts cracking. So this crack basically is called the brittleness of the ionic solid. The fourth property of ionic solids is it doesn't conduct electricity. Any material can conduct electricity when there is movement of charge in it. So in ionic solids, the ions are tightly packed. That is why the charges are not able to move and they do not conduct electricity. But when the ionic solid is dissolved in water or some other solvent, then they can move easily and only then they can conduct electricity. Another form in which ionic solid can conduct electricity is the molten form. So here the ions are fixed in a place for NaCl solid but when it is heated the solid melts in liquid form and then the ions can move easily and it can conduct electricity. The compounds which have covalent networks are also solids. The examples are diamond, silicon dioxide, silicon carbide, graphite. In first three examples, you can see that the structure is tetrahedral, but in the last one, the basic unit is different. In covalent networks also, the interactions depend on the bond length. 
if the bond length is higher, the interaction would be weaker and the melting point would be lesser. For example, here we can see that the melting point for diamond and graphite is the same, but for silicon dioxide, the melting point is lesser, which means that the bond length would be higher for silicon dioxide. Now let's see the properties of covalent networks. In the previous slide also, I showed you that three out of four compounds were having basic unit as tetrahedral structure. So most covalent networks have a tetrahedral structure based on sp3 hybrid orbitals. If you want to know more about hybridization, you can watch the topic 2.7 in which I have explained the hybridization in details. In the tetrahedral structure, all the electrons are held in strong covalent bonds and this results in high melting point. And as the electrons are held strong, that is why they are not able to move, which make the covalent network compounds as non-conductors or you can say they are bad conductors another property of covalent network compounds are they are hard but brittle as the interaction would be stronger it will make the compound hard but they are brittle because once if they are broken they cannot reform but graphite is an exception in the covalent network solids. In graphite, each carbon is bonded to three carbon atoms and that is why it has sp2 hybridization. Apart from that, the carbon has a p orbital which leads to delocalized pi electrons and these delocalized pi electrons basically results in different properties of graphite. The first property which is different from other covalent network solids is it is good conductor of electricity. So these pi electrons actually can move freely and that is why it becomes a good conductor of electricity. The second property is it has high melting point. Now because of these delocalized pi electrons there is more bonding between the carbon carbon atom. The third property is it is relatively soft due to weak London dispersion forces. These pi electrons results in generating dipoles in the structure and that is why a weak London dispersion forces are observed in the graphite. Due to this the graphite becomes relatively soft. The fourth property is it is good lubricant. So this lubricant property is because of the layers as these layers can slide over each other. That is why graphite is a good lubricant. The third type is metallic lattices. In metallic lattices, the metallic bonding is present. Here, I've compared the sodium, magnesium and aluminium metals. You can see that the metal ions are present like this as a network and in between the electrons are present as a pool. So what happens is when we move from sodium to aluminium, the ionic charge is increasing and the ionic size is decreasing. Apart from that, the number of outer shell electrons is also increasing as we are going from sodium to aluminium and this leads to increase in the attraction between the ions and that is why the melting and boiling point also increases. This is the reason that mercury is liquid at room temperature, cesium has a melting point of 28.4 degrees Celsius and tungsten has a melting point of 3680 degrees Celsius. As the electrons are present in between the ions as a pool, that is why these delocalized electrons can move freely and it makes the metals as well as its alloys good conductors of electricity. Other properties of metals are they are malleable and ductile. So malleable is when the metals are beaten up, they can be made into sheets and the ductility property means that when the metals are stretched, they can be made into wires. So why they are malleable and ductile? It is because of this kind of bonding in the metals. So you can see here that there are positive charges or you can see the metal ions which are dispersed like this and in between the electrons are present. So when the hammer blow is given on one layer, the layer actually is pushed and that is why it can be made into sheets as well as the wires without breaking. The metallic bonding is very strong and that is why it doesn't break easily. Another very important property of metals is it can form alloys. If we take only the potassium metal that this is the pure metal but when the sodium metal is introduced in this this is a mixture of two metals that is sodium and potassium and this mixture is called as an alloy. So alloys are of basically two types, substitutional alloy and interstitial alloy. In substitutional alloy, what happens is we actually substitute one atom with another metal atom. For example, this was initially the copper metal, but later one of the atoms of copper has been substituted by zinc atoms and this has changed this pure metal into an alloy. So in substitutional alloy, we need to have the two types of metals that have the similar size. The second type of alloy is interstitial alloy. In interstitial alloy, one type of metal is taken and another element which is introduced should be so small that it can occupy the holes in between. Or you can see the interstitial sites in between the atoms. Here, initially the iron metal was taken but later the carbon uh, element was introduced in between the holes. So this change of alloys from the metals it basically changes the properties of the metals. So alloys are poor conductors 
they are less malleable, they are less ductile and also stronger or harder. Last type of solids is covalent molecular solids. In these solids, the covalent bonding is there and they have weak van der Waals forces. So that is why the covalent molecules are mostly liquids or even gases at STP. For example, carbon dioxide, it is a gas and it has a covalent bonding. But there are some compounds also, those are solid at STP. For example, if we are talking about iodine, it has a melting point of 113.5 degrees Celsius. Iodine has strong intermolecular forces, which makes it solid. There are two types of covalent molecules. One is diatomic and another is polyatomic. Diatomic molecules can be from hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, chlorine, bromine, and iodine. And the polyatomic covalent molecules can be from phosphorus, sulfur, and selenium. As these polyatomic molecules, they can have multiple London dispersion forces, for example, in P4 and S8. That is why these compounds are also solid at STP. So melting point of sulfur is 112.8 degrees Celsius. And for phosphorus, it is 44.1 degrees Celsius. The molecular solids can be of three types. They can be nonpolar, polar, or hydrogen bonded. Out of these, the nonpolar and polar molecular solids are soft, and the hydrogen bonded molecular solid is hard because hydrogen bonding is stronger than in the nonpolar and polar compounds. Another thing is they all are not a good conductor of electricity and they all have low melting point. In non-polar molecular solids, the intermolecular forces are London dispersion forces. In polar molecular solids, the intermolecular forces are dipole-dipole interactions. And in hydrogen bonded molecular solids, the intermolecular forces is hydrogen bonding. For non-polar molecular solids, the examples are argon, CCl4, H2, CO2. For polar molecular solids, the Examples are HCl, SO2, and for hydrogen bonded molecular solids, the example is water. As I'm talking about solids, so it is in ice. Some of the biomolecules and polymers are also solid in state. So the polymers which have more number of attractions or multiple London dispersion forces, those polymers are solid at STP. For example, for polythene, the melting point is 110 to 130 degrees Celsius. You can see here that it is a kind of network. That is why they have multiple London dispersion forces, which makes it a solid. The strongest polymers have the amide linkage, which is also found in proteins. Amide linkage is basically C double bond O N. H. One of the strongest polyamide is Kevlar. In Kevlar, apart from this amide linkage, there is hydrogen bonding also present between the layers. And that is why the Kevlar is a solid. The sugars are also solid at room temperatures. It is because of the structure of the sugar molecule. Here you can see that this is a straight chain form of the sugar molecule and it has multiple hydroxyl groups. This leads to hydrogen bonding between the molecule which makes the interaction between the molecules very strong. As a result of this hydrogen bonding, all sugars are solid at STP and they are soluble in water. Although polysaccharides such as starch are sparingly soluble in water. Another biomolecule which is solid is amino acid. This is the basic structure of amino acid in which this is the side chain and this is the alpha carbon. So here also there is OH group and there is this NH group. Due to this, there is hydrogen bonding observed in the amino acids. And in neutral conditions, this hydrogen from this hydroxyl group will migrate to the amine group and makes this as a dipolar ion. Dipolar means there are two poles. That is one side is positively charged and another is negatively charged. This dipolar ion leads to strong interactions between the two molecules and makes the amino acid solid. The proteins are also solid at STP. So it is because of the complex structure of the proteins. There are a lot of interactions which can be seen here. Here there is hydrogen bonding. Here you can see that there is hydrogen bond between the peptide groups. Here you can see that there is hydrogen bonding between the side chains. And again here also there is hydrogen bonding which is seen in this coil form. So due to the presence of many types of interactions between the proteins, the proteins are also solid at STP. The last type of biomolecule which can be solids are lipids. So these lipids can be either solid or liquid depending on the structure of the molecule. So here one lipid is solid and here one lipid is liquid. This steric acid has all the bonds as single bonds. So this is completely saturated hydrocarbon. That is why the interactions between the molecules would be more. But in case of this structure, there is a double bond present and this double bond doesn't allow the molecule to rotate and reduces the intermolecular attraction. So that is why this 
lipid is liquid. So the lipids which are made from plants and marine animals, they are more unsaturated, means they have double bond and that is why they are likely to be liquid oils at room temperature. Whereas the lipids which are from animals, they are saturated. It means that they have single bond and they tend to be solid fats at room temperature. So the structure of the molecule, either it has single bond or double bond, basically results in the state of the lipid. The learning objective of the topic was explain the relationship among the macroscopic properties of the substance, the particulate level structure of the substance and the interactions between these particles. So in this video, I have talked about different types of solids, how they look like at the particulate level and about the interactions between the molecules. Please like and subscribe to the channel Log Iota and press the bell icon.